Like most people of color, black people in the new world, I came by my passion for literature in a circuitous way. A night journey marked by music, movement, improvisation, and smells of perfume, sweat, and humid, star-flickering nights. In Tozaki Shange. Paulette Williams, who later became known as Intozaki Shange, was born in 1948. The oldest of four children, Shange grew up in Trenton, New Jersey. Her parents embraced cultural diversity and, ga- and engaged in a range of artistic activities. They always supported their children's personal artistic explorations. When she was eight, the family moved to St. Louis, Missouri, where she was one of the first black children to integrate the public school system. This experience left a sense of anger and betrayal in her, but also strengthened Shange's fighting spirit and pride. While her parents were supportive of her ambitions, Shange grew critical of what she later called their black, middle-class conservatism. As Shange admitted in a 1976 Village Voice interview, this led her to rebel by adopting the idioms of the live-in maids who had cared for her as a child. In 1966, Shange entered Barnard College, but attempted suicide a year later due to her recent separation from her law school husband and also due to societal pressures. Her early adult journey was fraught with mental health struggles, but despite making three other suicide attempts, she managed to graduate from Barnard with honors in American Studies in 1970. Shange then moved to the West Coast where she continued her studies at the University of Southern California and lived with other writers, dancers, and musicians. In 1971, Paulette Williams changed her name to Ntozake Shange. Two South African friends baptized her in the Pacific Ocean with a name selected to express the personality that she wanted to manifest. Thus, she became Ntozake, meaning she who brings her own things, and Shange, one who walks with lions. Shange was only 27 years old when four colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough opened at the Booth Theater in 1976. As Shange's obituary in the New York Times noted, Miss Shange was a Broadway rarity on two accounts. She was black and she was a woman. For Colored Girls was an immediate hit and was nominated for a Tony Award. Shange described her work as a choreo poem, which she defined as a form of dramatic expression combining poetry, dance, music, and song. Now, the choreo poem is made up of a series of monologues for seven black female characters that are named for the colors of the rainbow. And this innovative play really has inspired generations of playwrights, um, people coming up and behind Shange, and continues to have um, quite a bit of influence today. It really was groundbreaking. In fact, the production of For Colored Girls was something completely new in the American theater. The play rejected a linear structure and realism in favor of poetry and also dance to represent a woman's experience. The performance was a consciousness raising event for many women and men. And in the clip that follows, Shange discusses the play and her poems, as well as, and this is interesting, Tyler Perry's production, um, the film, which appeared in 2010. In a later part of the interview, Shange said that she was mostly positive about Perry's interpretation, um, which is surprising in a way because 
you know, unlike Shange, he's quite mainstream. But she said, yeah, you know, he did a pretty good job. So take a look at this clip as she discusses the play. Communities and, and music and art and poetry as well. Right. And and it's all in it's all in this piece. The piece informs it. You you feel more familiar with the piece with with the, those times. The more you read those poems, because their sense of urgency and danger is much more uh, concentrated than ours may be right now. Although we may be going to another sort of dark ages in this country now. Somebody almost walked off with all of my stuff and didn't care enough to send a note home saying I was late for my solo conversation or two sizes too small for my own tacky skirts. Oh, I was elated at first and um, I was very excited uh, because I had been uh, approached at first by a young, brilliant young director and Zynga Stewart from Los Angeles, who had developed a, a workable script and um, was in the process of finishing up writing the script. And um, we were associated with Lionsgate. And after a few months of Zynga and I working on the script and talking with each other, I got a phone call from, um, from Lionsgate with Joe Passierna, Mike Passierna, and uh, I didn't know then Mr. Tyler Perry uh, were, on, were on the same line. And they called me and they asked, you know, they said to me a terrible question or a great question. And I said, okay, well, you know, uh, what is that? And they said, well, how would you feel if Mr. Perry was interested in doing um, a screenplay? Directing and producing for Color Girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. I say that only to say that the reason I say the whole title of my show is because Mr. Perry's title of his movie is for Color Girls, which is not the whole title of my book. So in order to get my book, you have to get my the whole title. And um, for Colored Girls, which now is available to millions of 20-year-olds and 19-year-olds and 28-year-olds and 38-year-olds, uh, it's going to be available to them in for a new and different forum. Another song with no singers, lyrics, no voices, unseen performances. woman with big legs and full lips become yourself I got a real dead loving here for you now I guess this is goodbye like you've never seen it before yeah, it's the best question or the worst question I mean you're both playwrights and I know in theater the playwright is king and in film the director is king um, does it um, like, did it feel like you were handing something over? Well, um, I did hand something over. I'm saying, like, uh, <laughs> it was it painful to to trust that this adaptation will be made to turn it into a film? Or, uh, I mean, was it? I think I think I don't know what you mean because um, I I turn it over for Color Girls once at least once or twice a month. Uh, for the last 40 years, I mean, I've been doing that. So it wasn't terribly scary to me. I've trusted it to other people sight unseen before. It, 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 was, um, it was a matter of trust, trust in my work and, and, and of the inability to escape its meaning uh, and, and trusting that the pure hearts would, would move in the right direction. Um, and trusting that viewers and readers uh, and actresses would take the words uh, with all their might and strength that they have and not, not be afraid by them or, or be made to feel silent or illicit or something. Even though I've, I've had the poems for 
over 30 years. There have been thousands of productions all around the world, and so it's constantly being renewed for me. But I think the opportunity Mr. Perry afforded was to expand my audience in my, in my demographic and beyond it, because I, now I have a whole slew of younger viewers, both men and women, and I think that's helpful. The original production and national tour of For Colored Girls made Intozake Shange a celebrity overnight. Now, while many critics and audience members just loved the play, some worried that Shange's depiction of black men was too negative and that these depictions fed into stereotypes. On the other hand, For Colored Girls was praised for the voice that it gave, the voice that it gave to black women and to their concerns. Shange did not relish being a celebrity and struggled with being so much in the spotlight. She continued her artistic endeavors and supported other younger artists who were coming up. The clip that follows is of Intozaki Shange speaking about her time at Barnard College. It was recorded after she had suffered a stroke, and you can hear that in her voice. And Barnard features this short video on their website in tribute to one of their most famous alumna. It's quite a moving uh, piece, and um, I really think you'll enjoy it. Came of age as a feminist at Barnard. I remember specifically going to consciousness raising groups and being the anti-war movement and being in the black student movement and all that happened at Barnard and all of my coming of age politically happened here. Emotionally and intellectually it happened here. I formed the basis of my critical thinking and I thought that my archives belonged here. I had had the opportunity earlier at Barnard to edit Fat Mama magazine, which was a collection of essays, music, photographs, and drawings by black Barnard women, because I felt that the literary magazine didn't represent us. Fat Mama is a vernacular term, P-H-A-T, fat meant well-built, sensual, like the Commodore's song, You're a Brick House. We want to demystify the black female body, which has been stereotypically used as a whore or an enticement to sex. So we had nudes of the female body in the magazine that demonstrated women as naked, beings of beauty. This little book was my first published book. And at that time, I, all the readings I did, I called for colored girls who considered suicide. And so I assembled the poems I had that I had been doing as for colored girls. Not all of those poems made it to the finished version of for colored girls but they're an indication of where the work was headed. The photograph is a dress rehearsal with Halifu Osamari, who's a dancer and composer, and she ran everybody's dance studio in Oakland, but she had a dance company that I belong to, along with Aisha here in the middle, and that's me doing an attitude jump, rehearsing the history of African dance as an hour assembly program in schools where there were a lot of black and Latin students. This quill was a gift a young woman gave me after a reading. I think I got it right after I had had the stroke. And so I could write, but I wrote haltingly because my right side was very weak so I never got to use it, but I wanted to keep it because it reminded me of this young woman who appreciated my work so much. I bought this 
rosary when I went to the Vatican because of my sense of goddess worship. And the Virgin Mary is the ultimate goddess for me. And I wanted a rosary from the Vatican because that's where the Virgin Mary is heralded most. But I wanted the rosary because when I got sick after the stroke and before the neuropathy, I used to say the rosary and Hail Marys to give me comfort. I needed to be in touch with the goddess to help make me well. And it worked. It has worked. It has worked. I have gotten better over the last 10 years. There was a point when I couldn't stand up. I couldn't stand at all. And I had no use of my hands. I would forget what I was saying in the middle of a sentence. So I have come back from a, almost a vegetative state. I'm very grateful to Barnard for giving all of these things that are precious to me a home and for allowing young scholars of color, young women of color, to find antecedents. And I just wanted to leave something here so the girls would be able to look at what life at Barnard as a black girl can become for you and what you can do with what you get from Barnard.